Robert, thanks for coming along. It's a real pleasure to be, uh, to be back in uh, Bratislava. Um, I, I, I like to start these things by asking the audience a question. So my question for you today is, are there any fans of Led Zeppelin in the audience? Put your hand up if you're a fan of Led Zeppelin. Oh my goodness, not, come on, who's heard of Led Zeppelin? One of my favorite Led Zeppelin songs is The Song Remains the Same. Uh, it's a fantastic song, um, but hopefully my song is not going to be quite the same as, as anne Catherine's because it, it, it's never good to have total repetition. Um, but there is also a Led Zeppelin film called The Song Remains the Same, and uh, in that film, Robert Plant, the lead singer, introduces probably the most famous Led Zeppelin song, which is Stairway to Heaven. He introduces Stairway to Heaven by saying, this is a song of hope. Well, I'm not going to sing today, but hopefully I'm going to give you a message of hope. And we, we certainly need that hope because last year was a disaster. Uh, unless you were invested in commodities, uh, as you can see from this uh, brick wall chart, pretty much all assets gave very poor returns. Uh, and I think there were a number of reasons for that. One is that the valuations at the start of the year of most assets were very high. Bond yields were extremely low. Uh, equities were uh, on pretty expensive multiples. There were a number of bubbles, cryptocurrencies. There were bubbles in FANG stocks. Uh, central banks had created bubbles all over the place. And that's never a good starting point for an investor. But also, of course, we had the inflation surprise. Um, I'm an economist too, and, and I think most of us were surprised uh, by what happened to inflation. Um, but the inflation surprise led central banks to try to get the inflation genie back in the bottle. And that led to a, an aggressive change in their stance. Bond yields increased quite rapidly, and that depressed the valuation of many assets. I happen to believe that inflation is also going to be important this year, but with inflation coming down rapidly, I think it's going to be more of a positive force this year. And that although we are looking at the very real risk of recession, I think markets are starting to look through that and look almost across the valley of recession to recovery, uh, to, to the recovery phase. And I think that's why um, riskier assets are actually doing better now. Because in that recovery phase, it's typically the risky assets that do quite well. But of course, before getting to the good news, there is bad news. And the bad news, I'm going to struggle here because I've got two screens, but um, the, 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 I need two laser guns. Um, the, the, the bad news is that economies are weakening. So in this right-hand chart, uh, you can see the weakening in manufacturing surveys in the US and Germany. And we've seen similar weakening on the service side of the economy as well. Um, so th there's definitely a slowdown going on. In Europe, it's easy to imagine why there would be that slowdown, the, the proximity to the war in Ukraine, um, the, 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 the impact of uh, the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia are negative for the European economy. Uh, and of course, the, the, the very strong rise in European gas prices. But the US is not immune either. We saw last week that in the month of December, retail sales and industrial production were much weaker than expected. And you can see from this chart, oops, sorry, wrong, uh, wrong button. Um, you can see that in the housing market, first of all, that new home sales have collapsed, and that's obviously because mortgage rates have gone up. And that then has led to a decline in housing starts, which means that investment in the housing stock is coming down. And the shaded areas in this chart show periods of recession. And you can see that in many 
periods of recession, there has been a preceding weakening of the housing market. So this weakening of investment overall um, very often is a precursor to recession. So the US may be in a better place than Europe, but it is certainly not immune to that recession risk. So I, I, you know, I, I agree, I think that we have to keep in mind that recession is certainly possible this year. And of course, the other bad news has been that central banks are tightening rapidly. Here's our measure of interest rates. It's the average measure across the 20 largest economies. Started very, at very low levels and then increased very rapidly. But also important is what's happening to central bank balance sheets. And in this right-hand chart, we show here the aggregate, the growth in the aggregate balance sheet of the five central banks that have done most quantitative easing. And we've gone from a situation of very strong growth in those balance sheets uh, during the uh, pandemic uh, that started in 2020. So we had very strong growth, and that not surprisingly generated good asset returns, not surprisingly, because central banks are buying assets when they are uh, practicing quantitative easing. But now what we have is that that very strong growth in balance sheets has turned to negative growth. We have a range of central banks that are purposefully shrinking their balance sheets and successively the Fed, the Bank of England and eventually the ECB are going to be releasing assets back into the markets, which provides something of a headwind. So although I'm more optimistic about assets this year, I think that there are headwinds to uh, asset price performance, so I'm not expecting massively positive outcomes. But when it comes to the performance of assets through the economic cycle, what we show here is so sort of breaking down a, a, a stylized version of the economic cycle into various phases. And, you know, it, the, oops, not getting used to the buttons here, sorry. Um, you know, we, we, we may feel that we're in contraction at the moment with economies, the global economy growing at a below trend rate and with growth actually declining successively. And usually, using US asset performance since 1970, in this phase of the cycle, equities, you know, assets such as equities underperform. Here we have bank loans, uh, and government bonds do quite well. But this is, this is a very, uh, uh, as Anne and Catherine pointed out, this, is, this has been a very strange uh, period. 2022 asset performance was very much out of the ordinary. Uh, and what we think is, is happening at the moment is that with inflation coming down, inflation having been the big problem last year, with inflation coming down, markets are starting to say, well, yeah, you know, we're maybe going to get recession, but let's think about what comes next. And so they're actually thinking about the recovery phase, and in that recovery phase, typically equities, high yield, bank loans are the assets that, that do better. So even though there is this risk of recession out there and everybody's talking about it, um, we're getting reasonable risk asset performance at the moment. And, and I suspect that you know, there's going to be some volatility as we get weak economic data, as we did last week, markets will worry about it. But as we go through the year, I suspect that those risk assets will outperform more defensive assets. So why am I confident about inflation coming down? Well, first of all, you don't need to believe Milton Friedman and, and, and that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. You don't need to believe that to be strictly true. But if you Take a look at this left-hand chart. Have a look at the money supply growth in the US. This is incredible. This is Banana Republic central banking. 27, 28% year-on-year growth in money supply during that pandemic phase. And not surprisingly, when you get that, you get 
core inflation rising with a lag. But look at what's happening now. We're no longer getting 27% year-on-year growth. That growth has come down to zero, and it's going to go negative. I'm not allowed to guarantee things, but don't tell anybody. I will guarantee you this money supply growth is going negative because money supply has been falling over recent months. So that monetary impulse to inflation has disappeared. And if you believe that monetary conditions have got anything to do with inflation, you would expect inflation pressures to ease. I think that US core inflation, which started the year at 6%, will have gone below 4% by the end of the year and beyond the way to falling even further. Personally, I don't care whether it gets to 2%, but I know the central banks are fixated on that. Um, and it probably takes another year or two to get down to anywhere near that sort of level. But if you don't believe in this monetary argument, then let's focus on the kind of shorter term and more immediate um, causes of inflation, commodity prices, for example. So during the, the, the early stages of the pandemic, when we had that very short recession, commodity prices fell, oil went negative. So we had this big drop. This is the year-on-year gain or loss in global commodity prices so it's across a broad commodity index. But when the recovery came, demand outstripped supply, and we got very big gains. And part of the reason that we got that recovery was because of what governments did in supporting household and business cash flows, and central banks facilitated that support coming from governments. So that inflation that we saw here coming through from commodity prices was really a cake that was baked by governments and central banks. They try to blame Vladimir Putin for it, but actually all that Vladimir Putin did was to add a layer of icing, a very thin layer of icing to that inflation cake that had already been baked. Here is the effect on commodity price inflation when Russia invaded Ukraine. Right wasn't exactly massive. But now the important thing is that commodity price inflation is very low, and again, it's going to go negative. Once we get beyond February, this is going to be negative. So commodity prices are falling. That inflation impulse is disappearing. And also, when you look at supply chain disruptions, which is this light blue line, this is a measure of supply chain disruption, which peaked you know, during that pandemic phase, semiconductor prices went up a lot. Uh, that led to auto prices rising. Uh, so we got inflation from that source. But those supply chain constraints are dissipating. And with the Chinese economy opening up, with them getting away from the zero COVID policy, we're likely to see less and less of this supply chain disruption. But I know what you're saying. You're thinking, what about inflation and core, inf you know, core inflation and wage inflation, which is a part of that? Well, it's quite interesting in the US at the moment. This chart basically, um, I, I didn't mention that, that when I, 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 was, I studied economics at the London School of Economics, my specialization was monetary economics, which is why I kind of harp on about uh, money supply, but also Phillips of Phillips curve fame was at the London School of Economics. So I've got a soft spot for the Phillips curve. And this chart shows you that the Phillips curve does still kind of work. It shows the relationship between earnings growth and unemployment. And the unemployment curve is inverted. So basically, it's like any market. It could be the market for potatoes. When there is a shortage of something, the price goes up. And when there is an excess supply of something, the price goes down. And unemployment is an indicator of whether there's excess demand or excess supply in the labor market. But take a look at what's happening at the moment. Wage inflation is actually coming down even before unemployment has gone up. And I think the reason why that's happening is because there were these sort of 
post-pandemic shortages that occurred in certain parts of labor markets. And I suspect what we're seeing here is the fact that those post-pandemic uh, distortions are maybe easing. But once the economy slows and unemployment starts to rise, then the usual cyclical downward pressure on wage inflation will also kick in. So wage inflation, I think, uh, will come down as economies slow. And finally, the other thing that I know is in the back of your mind, you're saying, well, what about shelter? What about the shelter component of inflation? Which, you know, is things like housing costs, rent. And the shelter component of consumer prices in the US is is around one third of the consumer price index. It is a very important part of the consumer price index. And you can see here in this chart, the acceleration in shelter component inflation. But also this chart shows you there is a lagged correlation with house price inflation. And house price inflation is falling in the US. House prices are actually falling, and the house price year on year inflation is coming down. And again, is likely to go negative. So this shelter component will also come down. That's the last shoe to drop in terms of inflation pressures coming down. So I'm pretty confident that headline inflation is going to fall a long way this year, may even fall to zero. And I'm focusing on the US just because the Fed is the central bank that really drives markets. I'm pretty confident that headline inflation will fall to zero temporarily, and that, as I've already said, core inflation will go below 4% and continue uh, declining. So I'm feeling pretty good about inflation. It's a cyclical phenomenon. It was an aggravated cyclical phenomenon over the last couple of years. But all of the cyclical forces, as far as I can see, are pointing downwards. Yes, the markets are suggesting that the Federal Reserve will continue tightening till the middle of the year and then reduce rates. I actually kind of agree with that. I think that by the end of the year, the Fed will be panicking. It's OK. The Fed can sound very brave when unemployment is staying very low. And yes, we're going to keep tightening. We're going to squeeze inflation out of the system. We're going to keep going. But once unemployment starts rising, they won't sound so brave. And I think they will be cutting rates by the end of the year. Um, I don't have, you may have gathered I don't have a great deal of respect for the Fed. But anyway, um, that's by the by. <laughs> um, but also in this chart, we can see that the markets are expecting the Bank of England, you know, Bank of England rates to rise faster than Fed rates and to catch up. Uh, I think the markets may be over-egging that. I don't think Bank of England rates need to rise that much. But also that ECB rates will rise faster than Fed rates. And that has very important implications. If interest rates in Europe are rising faster than interest rates in the US, or policy rates, then I would expect that to bring the dollar down. The dollar is already falling. The dollar became very expensive last year. In real trade-weighted terms, it became as expensive as, any as at any time since this kind of dollar bubble in 1985. So the dollar was very expensive, and currencies don't remain that expensive for a long time. Usually, you get a current account adjustment when currencies become expensive. And that current account adjustment was already setting in. And usually, when you get that current account adjustment, it eventually brings the currency down. But we know that in the short term, it's not current account movements that determine currency movements. It's more to do with financial flows. And one way of looking at what those financial flows may be is looking at bond yield spreads. So US Treasury yields versus, for example, European government bond yields. And what this dark blue line shows in this right-hand chart is the spread between US bond yields and yields elsewhere. And the light blue line is, once again, the uh, real trade-weighted value of the dollar. And the two seem to have decent correlation. When spreads widen in favor of the dollar, US yields rise faster 
than yields elsewhere, the dollar tends to strengthen, and vice versa. Well, over the last two years, the spread was widening in favor of the dollar in anticipation of the Fed tightening more rapidly than central banks elsewhere. But now that spread has kind of stopped widening, but the dollar kept rising, and it was a bit like the roadrunner running off the edge of a cliff and continuing to run and, and not realizing that there was nothing beneath his feet, and then all of a sudden looking around and, and collapsing. And the dollar has kind of started to do that. It was running on empty towards the end of last year, but has now started weakening. And I think that will continue. And I think there are a number of implications of that. First of all, when the dollar weakens, it tends to support commodity prices versus what they would have been otherwise. So I think it helps, for example, gold. Secondly, uh, I think it helps emerging markets. It helps emerging market assets. So weakening dollar, good for emerging market assets. I like emerging market assets. And thirdly, it probably at the margin helps US equities versus equities elsewhere. I don't particularly like US equities. I think they're still expensive. Um, but a weakening dollar does give some help to those US companies that are earning money overseas. So weakening dollar has a range of implications. But what about other asset categories? Yes, uh, at the beginning of 2022, why on earth would you have bought government bonds? You know, here's the 10-year tips yield. It's the inflation-protected yield uh, in the US Treasury market, minus 1%. Why would you buy that? that you know, who would believe that minus 1% loss per year over 10 years is a good investment? But now, that real yield has risen to something like 1.5%. So all of a sudden, government bonds have come back into the discussion. So in the middle of last year, I went a little bit overweight government bonds at the global level. I've just brought it back to neutral because I'm, I want to take a bit more risk in my allocations. But government bonds, yes, are back. I always thought it was actually that bond is back, you know, sort of James Bond is back. But anyway, uh, bonds are back in that sense. But having said that, and, and, and actually in the short term, it, you know, for cyclical reasons this year, I think those yields can come down. But over the medium to long term, I think these yields still need to go higher. This, this is the real yield. Rather than 1.5%, I would say 2.5% two, two would be more reasonable. So short term, good. Medium to longer term, probably returns not going to be brilliant. When it comes to credit spreads, again, looking at the US market, at the beginning of 2022, the spreads were very narrow. This is investment grade spread. This is the high yield spread. So those spreads were narrow, but they normalized. They went back to the historical averages uh, during 2022. In my forecasts for 2023, my presumption is that those spreads will widen a bit as economies weaken. And I also assume that the high yield default rate will normalize. High yield defaults in Europe and in the US are very low at the moment. So I'm assuming that they will uh, increase back to historical norms. And those are, so those are actually quite bearish assumptions for credit. But nevertheless, even with those assumptions, I still come up with, because these starting yields are now relatively attractive, I still get reasonably good returns, as I'll show you in a minute, on credit uh, globally. And so actually, I'm overweight uh, credit, both investment grade and high yield. anne Katrine spoke about this decomposition of uh, returns within the equity market. I'll show it in a slightly different way, but it's the same message. Um, this is the cumulative growth in global profits last year. I expected it, like many people, to come, you know, to weaken, but actually it remains slightly positive. So the decline in equity markets, the losses that we made on equities last year were not as a result of falling profits. They were as a result of rising bond yields, the purple line, which is inverted, which caused a reduction in 
in valuation multiples. There was a compression of valuation multiples. This year, for 2023, I think we will get that reduction in earnings, but it will be balanced by multiple expansion because bond yields are falling and I think they may continue to fall. So equities, I think, on balance can generate maybe small positive returns. And where would you focus uh, within equities? Well, I actually quite like Chinese equities, and I've liked them for, for a, a little while. I was a bit too early on this, but now it's working out quite nicely. But from an economic momentum perspective, just as US money supply growth is plummeting, Chinese money supply growth is increasing. The People's Bank of China has been loosening. The Chinese economy was in recession last year, in, at the beginning of the year, and I, it's not difficult to imagine economic momentum improving, especially as they remove zero COVID. And when you combine that with the fact that the valuation of Chinese equities is really low. These are cyclically adjusted PE ratios. So today's price divided by a 10-year moving average of earnings, those Chinese equities are very cheap within their own historical range and cheap compared to other regions, uh, especially the US and India. Emerging markets overall are quite cheap. I like emerging markets, as I've said. And the spread on emerging market bonds, these are dollar-denominated emerging market bonds, the spread versus US yields is also quite attractive. So whether it's equities, whether it's bonds, whether it's real estate, I actually quite like um, emerging markets. So here are my projected returns for the year uh, on global assets. Uh, it, now it's upward sloping. This wasn't always the case during 2022. But basically, the more risk we're taking, the better the returns I'm anticipating, except for commodities, because I think European gas prices continue to normalize downwards, which I think will pull down energy prices, you know, other energy prices. But when I run these returns through an optimizer, it's telling me, yeah, you know, the equity return looks quite good, but there's quite a bit of volatility. You should actually prefer credit. So I'm overweight credit, investment grade and high yield. Here is my model asset allocation. Overweight both investment grade and high yield at the global level, but slightly underweight equities because I'm underweight US equities, which, as I've said, I think are expensive. Chinese equities, I love them. I'm maximum allocated and overweight emerging market equities. The two changes that I made back in November looking ahead to this year were in order to make the, the, the allocations more risk taking was first of all to reduce cash to zero. I'd been overweight cash or maximum allocated to cash for some time. I reduced that to zero and replaced it with gold because I think the dollar was going to fall and that bond yields were going to fall, that's a good environment for gold. The second change that I made was to um, bring the government bond allocation back to neutral and to take the high yield allocation overweight, kind of looking forward to that recovery phase in the markets. Uh, I'm also a little bit overweight uh, real estate, zero allocated to commodities. Regionally, when you look at it across assets, it's all about emerging markets. Now, I've got one minute to go, so let's go back to a bit of fun. We started with Led Zeppelin. Uh, let's finish with a bit of fun. This is my list of 10 surprises for the year. I draw this list up every year. I've stolen the idea from an old colleague of mine called Byron Wien, and I've rebranded it and called it the Aristotle list. Um, but the idea is to come up with things that are not necessarily my central scenario, hopefully not too consensus, because out of consensus ideas are where you make the best returns or avoid the biggest losses. Um, so the first three I've already covered. 
I, I think the yen is going to be very strong because I think the Bank of Japan, once we get a new governor in April, may start to normalize. And at the margin, that's going to be a big change. Um, number four, I hope, I, I pray I'm wrong, but I think there's a chance that the Conservative Party will, will panic before the end of the year and replace Rishi Sunak. And who's the darling of the Conservative Party? It's Boris Johnson. Turkey, this is quite a, an outlier because Erdogan has got a nice habit of manipulating the elections, but I suspect with 80% inflation last year, he's behind in all of the opinion polls when it comes to the second round. I could be up against him and I would probably win um, without manipulation. So uh, I think there could be a change of president in Turkey. Turkey is very important from a geopolitical perspective, so this could be uh, very important. Um, Fang plus stocks. Uh, this was one of the bubbles down 45% last year or in the first year after the, the peak in, in the bubble. Uh, typically, these bubbles don't just finish after a year of decline. The, the deflating of a bubble carries on for maybe two or three years. So I see more downside there. Uh, if you really want exciting government bonds, take a look at Ukraine. Dollar-denominated 10-year yield in Ukraine of 33%. Very risky, but my presumption is that Western governments will not allow Ukraine to get to a position where they default. Um, if you're looking for an exciting stock market, take a look at Pakistan. I always like it when, a, um, when the P-E ratio is below the dividend yield. And P-E of 4 in Pakistan and dividend yield of 105 suggests there's either going to be a disaster or it's going to be actually quite good returns. And I suspect it may be good returns. I've covered number nine, Chinese stocks. I always have a sporting one. Last year, it was that Argentina would win the World Cup. This year, you may not care about rugby, but I've got Ireland playing France in the final uh, and winning. So I'm out of time. Thank you for your attention um, and uh, look forward to, uh, to having a panel and getting questions.